I'm recording a video on the chi-squared test. It's going to be a really short video. The chi-squared test is perfect when you have probabilities or predicted frequencies. For example, like flipping a coin, you expect it to be heads 50, 50 times and tails 50 times if you throw it 100 times. It's also good for genetics. It's also good for roly-poly bugs. And if you're trying to compare if they're going to go to the light or the dark, and you do it a certain number of times, and you can predict if they don't care, then 50% of the time they'll go there, 50% of the time they'll go there. So if you take a look at this, you can see, same as with the t-test, we can have a null hypothesis and a alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that there's no expected difference. There's no difference between, sorry, there's no difference between the observed and expected frequencies. And the alternative hypothesis is that something else is happening and uh, it's causing things to change. So let's look at a few examples here. So here's some pre-prepared data. So if you were to flip a coin a total of 80 times, so this is the exact type of table that you would actually set up. So flip a coin 80 times, um, what do I expect? Well, a coin, if it's a normal coin, should land 40 times heads, 40 times tails. But I did this experiment and I got 35 heads and 45 tails. Well, is that different enough for me to think that the coin is actually broken or that it's a trick coin or something like that? That's what the chi-square test will help us to do. Or are these results kind of no... Not, not that weird and could just be due to random changes. Um, as you know, flipping a coin, you're, never, you're, you're very rarely going to get exactly 40 times heads and 40 times tails. But how different does it have to be? So if you look at all the numbers that are right here, is it getting too loud? You just take the observed, you put down your two categories, you write your total, you put down the numbers you actually measured, which is the observed. The expected, which is just the total divided by the number of categories, in this case there's two, so it's 40 and 40. You do the O minus the E, you get minus 5 here, 45 minus 40, you get 5. You're going to square these numbers, so just follow the instructions here, square it. You're going to divide them by the expected value, so in this case, this is actually going to be 25, this column, divided by expected, do the same over here, and you add these two numbers together and you get your value. That's your your test value. We call that your chi-squared value. Kind of like in the t-test, this would be your t-value. So we want to compare this to the critical value. So just like in the t-test, not too hard to figure out the degrees of freedom. In this case, the degrees of freedom is equal to the number of groups or categories that you have minus one. So if I have two categories minus one, then my degrees of freedom are going to be one. And again, I'm aiming for the 95% confidence level. So you go back and refer to a table. This is a different table than the t-test table. This is called the chi-square table. Same as before, 95% confidence, degrees of freedom 1. The critical value is 3.84. Does our chi-square val value beat 3.84? In this case, check, take a look at the sentence, maybe pause the video and read this slowly. Our chi-square value 1.25 is not greater than the critical value. Therefore, the results are not statistically significant. We conclude that there's no reason for us to believe that our observed values are any different from the expected results. The coin appears to be a normal coin. And uh, if you put this all down, then I guess you end up with a situation where uh, you do not reject your null hypothesis. Our chi-squared value did not beat the critical value. All right, one more example for you to try out. So let's say we are at an unnamed high school somewhere in Tokyo and people are asked the question Channing Tatum or Zach Efron. I'm told this is the correct way to spell his name. We ask a total of 40 students. If no one really cares about these two <laughs> like me, then I would expect maybe 20 would say Channing Tatum and 20 would say Zach Efron. In actuality from personal surveys, I have found that 31 students have picked Channing Tatum and 9 have picked Zac Efron. Is that significantly different based on what I expect? Based on probabilities, I would say that this is what the number should be. Well, see if you can work out the rest. Pause the video, figure out these, 31 minus 20, blah, 9 minus 20, blah, square those values. Divide those values by the expected and add these 
together. Which one got fat? When does some of the, one of these guys got fat? You'll get a total. Pi squared equals two. Find out what the critical value is. Actually, in this case, we still have two categories at the 95% confidence level. The critical value is actually still the same. So make your own conclusion from this. Are these results significant enough? Is it okay for us to conclude that students at an unnamed school in Tokyo, Japan actually would prefer one of these over the other in terms of acting? All right, good luck. Okay,